Since about mid-January, I've been doing what a lot of you have been trying to do since mid-January as well. I've been going to the gym, right, you know, pumping some iron, going running, watching what I eat to, uh, to try to lose a few pounds. And if you've ever done that, if you've ever tried to lose a few pounds and you know that moment of what it is like uh, right before you step on the scale. I give myself a cheat day about once a month to eat all the cookies and cake and pie. Um, if you see what my weak spot is, a sweet spot, a sweet thing, you know, sweets. And so I, on the morning of the cheat day, I always weigh myself because that's been about a month. And I want to see what progress I've made. And if you've ever done that, then you know what it's like, how frustrating it could be to step on that scale and see no progress. Amen. Come on. <laughs> all right. Come on. Like, like you went all that work in and you don't see any results. Because we live in a culture of rewards. And we expect to be rewarded for our hard work. We expect to be rewarded for our sacrifice. We love rewards. That's probably why you chose the credit card that you have. Because of rewards. You expect to be rewarded on the 1st and 15th of every month for the work you do for your employer, right? And if you are not, you will find another employer because this is an expectation that we will have a reward. And I know that any of our incredible students have never, ever done this, but occasionally children will start doing chores and behaving and cleaning up and helping out when they want something, when they want to be rewarded. Have y'all ever done that? No, no, not our mountaintop kids, but other people. I've heard of this. Because we kind of view relationships this way. We, through, we view relationships often through the lens of transactions. That I do something for you and you do something for me. I give something to you. You reward me. And there is a transaction. And just like you would be pretty upset if one of the first or the 15th came around and that transaction didn't happen. And that direct deposit didn't hit like it is always supposed to hit. You would say, hey, 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 hey. What's going on? You, it, it is incredibly frustrating, right, when you're trying to lose a few pounds to step on that scale and not see a reward, not see the results from all the early mornings at the gym and practically starving yourself. And you just throw the scale out the window. Or maybe I'm the only one that's done that. Anybody else? That's, that's the way it feels sometimes. We expect to be rewarded. We just get mad and and our relationship with God, we often view through this lens of transactions. Deep down, we want to believe that our obedience, that our faithfulness will be rewarded. That it will pay off. That we will have a transaction with God. That if we are good, we follow the rules, God will bless us. That if we are obedient, God will answer our prayers. That if we follow the commandments, that God will give us the job that we've applied for and interviewed for. That if we tithe, we will receive financial blessings. We want to believe that in the end, in crunch time, when it's all said and done, that our sacrifice, our surrender will all pay off. It will all be worth it. One day. But I want to ask you a question that we're going to wrestle with today. Are you okay if your faithfulness isn't rewarded in this life? Are you okay if your obedience to God, if you do not see the results, if there is no transaction between you and God for the faithfulness that you give God in the end? We do not like to talk about the potential answer to this question. But by the time we're done today, what I hope to introduce you to and I hope that we will all see is the potential power of what it means to leave a legacy if we will be like a New Testament influencer who had the courage to answer this question, 
yes. Who, who decided that the right thing is the right thing no matter what. That obedience counts no matter the cost. The, an influencer who decided that Jesus is the reward and he is enough. In fact, we're going to see this influencer, this young influencer, really changed the world, really impacted the way that we experience faith. And man, speaking of young people, hey, listen, after seeing this morning and seeing our young people, aren't you a little more encouraged about the future? Are we grateful to be a part of a church that, are, that young people are excited about their faith? And we're going to see, this is a story about a young person who was kind of thrown into leadership in the church and how God used his incredible faith and his testimony to eventually change the world. This series is a study through the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It is unlike any other book. There are others that tell the story of Jesus, and there are others that kind of tell the story of what it means to follow Jesus. But the book of Acts, or otherwise known as the Acts of the Apostles, was written by the gospel writer Luke. But it's the only book that details kind of the birth of the Christian movement, the birth of the church. And at the very beginning of Acts, it kind of starts off where the Gospels leave off. They have 11 disciples because Judas has deserted them and has betrayed Jesus. So they elect another disciple to round out the 12. It's a guy named Matthias. We don't know much about him. It's about the only time he's even mentioned in the scriptures. But it at least gives them 12 disciples. But even with a full team of 12 disciples, the demands of the daily operations of the church is becoming too much. Namely, the feeding of the widows. Because they are doing life together. Everything is happening together. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preaches a sermon in which 3,000 people get saved. And 3,000 people is just too big of a church for 12 pastors to handle. So... They elect some servants, some helpers, to be a part of the daily operations of the church to help with the feeding of the widows and all the other stuff, all the, all the other things that the church has to do to operate so that they can dedicate themselves and their time to teaching, preaching, and to prayer. And one of the people that they elect, one of the young men that they elect as one of these servants is a fellow named Stephen. And this is the first time that we hear of him in the story of the church, the first time that he kind of comes, comes up. So let me tell you a little bit about him. He has been sitting in the wings, apparently, and he's been building a character, though. Luke describes him as different than a lot of the other servants. Luke describes him as a man full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of power. It is apparent early on, that Stephen is more than just a helper, more than just a servant. God has a calling on his life. He is a powerful force for the kingdom, and his life and death would be a turning point in Christianity and the faith that would eventually find its way to you and me. And here's what's so clear about Stephen. That his roots are growing deep while he waits for the right time. It is so apparent that as he is thrust to the front, as he is thrust into leadership, that he has deep roots. And so many young people, and listen, teenagers and college students, let me just, I know it is so easy in this world that we live in to, I want a bigger platform. I want to be an influencer. I, I want a bigger stage. And no matter, or, you know, I want the promotion. I want to sit at the board table. And can I just tell you, while you are in the background, would you make sure that your roots are growing deep so that you'll be rooted when it's the right time? Stephen, it's apparent early on that his roots have been growing deep while he has been waiting for God to call him to the right time. So we're going to pick it up right at the beginning of kind of Stephen's story after he is called and chosen as one of these seven. Acts uh, chapter 6, verse 8, if you were sitting there at home and you got your, your Bible there, you want to open it up to Acts 6 so that we can follow along. This is what it says about Stephen. Now, Stephen was a man 
full of God's grace and power, Luke pours more accolades out on him. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. He had already said he was full of the Holy Spirit. And now it is saying that he's full of God's grace and full of power. There's obviously something about him. And this sentence right here is the first instance recorded in the New Testament of anyone other than one of the apostles performing a miracle. So we see that he has an apostolic anointing on his life. That God has done something and is doing something in Stephen that is on the level of what we have seen in the guys that hung out with Jesus for three years. And you would think that everyone would be excited about his calling, excited about his anointing. You would think that everyone would be excited that God is doing miracles through him. Yeah, not so much. Listen to what Luke writes next. Opposition arose. Have you ever had opposition arise? Opposition arose. However, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and then it goes on to say Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. He has a calling on his life. He has an anointing from God on his life. He is doing miracles. And not everybody likes it, and not everybody recognizes it. And what we find here true of Stephen is something that we don't like to think about, and we don't even want to believe is true, but it's crystal clear in Stephen's life that your calling might create conflict. We, we live with this assumption that if I am following God's will and that I'm following God's call in my life and I'm doing what God wants me to do, then everything is just going to be smooth sailing. Everything is just going to be easy. But your calling might actually be the thing that creates conflict. I see this so often in young people who are going into ministry in the church and they just think like, well, I'm following God and I'm doing you know, what God wants me to do and so I'm going to go into ministry and church work is going to be easy work. And I always just be like, have you read the book of Acts? Like it's not easy. Your calling might create conflict and no matter your vocation, no matter your occupation, no matter your calling, it might create conflict. Our very faith is built on a truth that God became a man who created so much conflict they killed him. Like our faith is built on the reality that God became a human who was perfect and never sinned and God was fully present in and yet so much conflict was created because of him living out this calling that they killed him for it. Your calling might create conflict. Opposition might arise. God has an enemy and that means the children of God have an enemy too calling. It might create conflict. There might be opposition that arises. And this opposition, this moment, reveals something about Stephen. He's ready for the moment. But they, Luke writes, remember they're arguing with him. A bunch of them. Different groups. But they could not stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Oh, he was ready. This kid that was somehow chosen as one of these seven helpers, seven servants, man, there was a calling on his life more than just to be a helper or a servant. He has a wisdom that's not book smarts. He has a wisdom that is spirit-led, spirit-endowed, spirit-giving. And what, wouldn't this be great if this was the end of the story? Wouldn't this be great that the end of the story is that Stephen had so much spirit-given power and wisdom that he convinced his opponents, he convicted his adversaries to repent at that moment. Wouldn't that be a great end of the story? That's not quite how it ends. Luke says, after listening to him, they couldn't argue with him. He was smarter than they were because God was speaking through him. Luke says, they 
secretly persuaded. They, they started going behind closed doors. Secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So, they stirred up the people. And this phrase right here, I'm going to talk more about it in just a minute. They stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. Anybody they could find. They stirred him up. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. And then Luke writes that they produced false witnesses who testified This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place because they were in the temple and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. And up to this point, we haven't read that Stephen has said any of those things. But it's a conspiracy. It's a setup. That phrase, you remember that said that... um, They stirred up people against him. Luke, this is fascinating, Luke is probably the most educated of the New Testament writers. He's a a physician, very educated, and he uses a Greek word here. It's the only time it's ever found in the New Testament. And the word, you know, in the Greek, the Y's sound like U's. Hupabalo is the word. It means to suggest to the mind, to instigate, to conspire. What's, what, what English word do you think we get from this? What do you think? Hyperbole. It's just a bunch of hype. It's made up. It's exaggeration. He said nothing about any of this. They have made it up. They have, provo- they have produced false witnesses People plain lie about him. And I want you to know something. You can be anointed of God. You can be called of God. And you can do everything right, everything faithful, everything obedient, everything good, everything holy, and people can still lie about you. Teenagers, listen. You can do everything right, everything faithful, everything obedient, and some text thread can still say a lie about you. Somebody can still put something on TikTok that's a lie about you. Somebody can still snap something that's a lie about you. Just because you do everything right, everything faithful, everything holy, everything true does not mean that people won't lie about you. So what are you going to do? When somebody lies about you, do you give up? You going to run? You you going to just say I- I'm done with it? Are you going to fold? Or are you going to stand up? Do what you were called to do, and most importantly, be who you were called to be. Well, you'd probably guess that we wouldn't be talking about Stephen in a series called Influencers if he didn't stand up in the moment. It's something supernatural kind of happens. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. They're just like, What's this guy going to do? They know he's lying. They know that lies are being told about him. They know it's a lie. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, this doesn't mean just to mean that he was good looking. There was something about his countenance. He was glowing. And listen, it's it's not lost on any of those that are sitting there because they are schooled in Hebrew history that one of the charges levied against him is a charge about Moses because they would all remember one other time that someone's face glowed. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two stat, uh, the, the tablets with the Ten Commandments on them as the voice of God, the messenger of God. Moses' face, his countenance glowed and shone like an angel. And it was a message to all the Israelites at that time that this is my messenger I want you to listen to. And so this kind of shakes everybody up there because they know something is up. God is up to something. 
And so the high priest, they kind of, for a second, they just kind of like, oh. And the high priest says, maybe we need to listen. What do you have to say? So Stephen preaches a sermon to them. That's really more like a history lesson. He kind of starts at the beginning of the, the nation of Israel. And here's the language that he uses. He says often within the sermon, he says brothers and sisters. Because they're his people. He's Jewish. He says often um, our ancestors as he tells the story. He talks about how God called a people out of nothing from one man named Abraham. And he told Abraham, I want you to go to a land that you don't even know about yet. You don't even know the name of it, and you don't even know which direction. I just want you to follow me. And Abraham is faithful, and through Abraham, God builds this nation through his son Isaac and his son Jacob, who has 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joseph rises to prominence among those 12 and ends up a second in command of the kingdom of Egypt and ends up saving the world through having God's wisdom through an incredible famine, and it not just also saves the people of Israel. And in Egypt, they end up settling there while Joseph is in power, and they grow in number and mighty. But one day, a pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph comes into power, and he puts his whole family, all the Israelites, into slavery. And once again, they are away from their homeland for 400 years under slavery. But God was with them had not forgotten them, and he raises up a leader named Moses who delivers them out from under Egyptian slavery, but they don't immediately find the promised land. They wander for 40 years in the desert, Stephen reminds them. And he says, hey, don't you guys remember that they didn't even have a temple then. They had a tabernacle, like this makeshift, temporary, portable tent Thing where the presence of God dwelt. And wherever they landed for a season, that's where the tabernacle was. And when they finally even reached the promised land, and the place they always wanted to go with a king like they'd always wanted to have named David, David said, well, I'm going to build a temple. And God said, no, no, you're not. Don't you know that I've never been a God who lives in houses made by human hands? It is a reminder that Stephen is giving them that God has always been on the move. And they are so obsessed with their traditions and they are so obsessed with this place that they are sitting and standing in this temple. And he wants to tell them the temple wasn't the point. The temple was supposed to point to the point. And then Stephen makes his point. And this is the very end of the sermon. You stiff-necked people. Now, I tried this at my first church that I served. And I'm just telling you, if you think about going to ministry, I wouldn't do it. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah, Habakkuk, he could have said the whole list. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law, you, God gave you the law through Moses, given through the angels, but you have not obeyed it. Now here's What's interesting, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches a sermon that's almost identical. Peter's sermon in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, he, he says all the kind of similar things. He walks through the nation, the history of Israel, and he kind of leads it up to Jesus. And he, he says sort of the same thing. He's like, you know, you, <laughs> you guys killed him, and, uh, you know, just like all the other prophets. And at the end of, of his sermon, he says, uh, it says, Luke writes, that the people are cut to the heart. And they raise their hands and they're like, Peter, what should we do? They're convicted. And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And that day, 3,000 people are saved. And it's possible, 
It's probable that Stephen was in the crowd that day and he heard the sermon that Peter preached or perhaps he went back later on YouTube and copied the notes. I don't know. And he gives an almost identical sermon with the same really tough challenge at the end. And what's going to happen this time? Another 3,000 saved? Not quite. It says this, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. You see, you see, if you read the scriptures, you'll hear this phrasing a lot, gnash their teeth. You're like, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What was that really like? I don't know, but I think it was something like this. She might be a Pharisee. <laughs> right? It's just kind of angry. But then it turns physical. And they charge at him. Luke says that this, they covered their ears. And yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed out at him. Dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And this is the turning point in the story, and this is the turning point in perhaps the history of Christianity. I would argue that, that this was the point in which the church turned in a new direction. And here's what we're going to learn about Stephen. Like, what is this moment going to be? Here's what we're going to find out. Crisis reveals character. Crisis doesn't build character. Crisis reveals character. And we're going to find out at this moment, does Stephen have what it takes? Has, does he really have the deep roots to, to when things aren't going right? If you want to make a difference, you'll have to be different at your defining and darkest moment. If you want to leave a legacy, you might have to leverage your lowest moment for the Lord. And there was someone there looking on to see just what kind of character Stephen had. That's what Luke writes. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee and a leader in the synagogue and I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder if he was seeing if there was something different about Stephen. I mean, up to this point, Stephen had been full of the power of God, full of the Holy Spirit. He had worked miracles. He had worked signs. When they came at him intellectually, the Spirit empowered him to speak with a wisdom that nobody had ever even heard before. And when they were ready to pounce on him the first time, his face illuminated. But now, when the blow by blow of the rocks are slowly knocking the life out of his body, how will he respond? It says, while they were stoning them, you know what Stephen did? He prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. It is almost as if he is following a Savior who taught us to pray, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's living it because he really believes in that kind of Savior and that kind of faith. It's not a show. It's not a game. And when he said this, Luke writes, he fell asleep. That's just a nice way of saying he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. On that day, something happened. On that day, a true influencer was revealed because crisis reveals character. 
Stephen was not in it to win at all cost. He was in it to witness to the soul-shaping, life-giving, resurrection power of Jesus in him, even to the point of death. And up to this point, the persecution of Christians had been fairly benign. You might get arrested, you might go through a trial, and you might spend a couple of nights in prison, and then they'd let you go and tell you not to do it anymore. Maybe at worst, you would get flogged, but not to harm you too much. But this is the first time that a Christian is killed for his faith. Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. But his influence and death changed human history. Stephen's story does not end with an angel coming to rescue him in a miracle. It ends in a death and a heap of bloody rocks. And can we just name this? None of us want Stephen's story. Right? None of us want Stephen's story. None of us want a chapter and a half that's a byline in history that ends in death in which we don't see the reward for our faith, in which we don't meet our potential, in which we don't get to do what we think we're called to do. We want Peter's story. We want to be the hero. We want chapter after chapter about us. We want to be the rock on which the church is built. We want miracles and signs to happen through us. We want an angel to break us out of prison and for people to be healed by our shadow. We want to be Peter, but what if God's calling you to be a Stephen? And because here's what's so fascinating, here's what's so fascinating about it, that Stephen's death changed everything. It might take your death, just like it took Stephen's death to leave a legacy. Listen to what the end of the story says. And all except the apostles. How many apostles were there? Twelve. How many Christians were there? Three thousand plus. Check this out, students. Check this out. And all of a sudden, three thousand thousand disciples were unleashed into the world no longer staying in the cocoon of Jerusalem they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria just like Jesus had asked them to do in the first place godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in, on, in prison, and the enemy thought he'd won. But God had used a mess and turned it into a message and a tragedy and turned it into a triumph because that's just the kind of God he is. Because when Jesus spoke to his disciples before he attended, uh, ascended into heaven. He told them, I want you guys to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in the region of Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And it took Stephen's death for them to finally break out of Jerusalem. It took the persecution of Christians catalyzed by Stephen's stoning and death to unleash, to release Christians into Judea and Samaria. And wouldn't you know it, God took the one who oversaw it all, Saul, as the final piece of the puzzle to reach the very ends of the earth when he one day went to Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the power of the resurrected Jesus forever transformed him from the antagonist Saul to the apostle Paul, a man who would literally change the world starting churches in every Greek and Roman province, writing two-thirds of the New Testament and turning the Roman empire upside down on its head and Stephen was never around to see it are you okay if your faithfulness isn't rewarded in this life or do you have to see the reward do you does the transaction is that what you're looking for in this walk with Jesus are you okay if your faithfulness your obedience never is apparent to you on this side of eternity because I want to tell you you have no idea what God wants to do with your obedience in your darkest moment you have no idea how God wants to use you to be Jesus for someone if you will be Jesus to someone like Stephen was to Paul you have no idea what Paul is watching you 
who might change the world because of what they saw in you. You know, the Social Security Agency of the United States says that in the last hundred years, that there have been 500,000 men named Peter and about 1.2 million named Paul. Well, there have been about 3 million named Stephen because sometimes it takes a couple thousand years to leave a legacy. Are you okay if it takes a couple thousand years to leave yours? Jesus is the reward. Our job is to obey no matter the cost and leave the rest up to him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Stephen and others like him who gave their lives for a cause and a call and a faith that eventually made its way back to us. Lord, the reward of your mercy and grace and forgiveness is enough. We obey. We're in. And the rest is up to you.